Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. And uh, this is the second panel for 2020 and we're very happy that we have Adam Reed, who is the Director of uh, External Affairs at Suez Recycling and Recovery, moderating this for us. As you all know, Adam has moderated several panels for us uh, in 2019. And uh, this year he is going to be moderating five more panels, which we are very excited about. If you haven't seen his panels before, please go to the video panel sections and you, section and you will find it there. So uh, today we are going to discuss the climate crisis and uh, where we are at now and what we should be doing right now. And uh, we have three other panelists today. We have Lee, who is also from Suez Recycling and Recovery. He is the Environment and Sustainable Development Lead there. We have Mickey, who you cannot see because of a technical issue, but he's going to speak and you will listen to him, who is the Managing Director at Somerset Waste Partnership. And we have Paul, who's a managing director of Thrift Resource Management. And if you have attended any panel moderated by Adam, you know that it's going to be very casual. He's going to keep it very open. There'll be a lot of interesting questions and conversations. So please ensure you use the Q&A sections. You put your questions out there because he will make sure most of the questions are answered. So uh, that's about it. Over to you, Adam. Thank you very much, Sweta. Afternoon, those of you in a time zone somewhere near the UK, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are. It's been a pleasure to, uh, to welcome you in this new year with a new program of events. Uh, the first of my five, as Sweater says, I should be getting paid by the hour, but I'm not. Um, but but Sweater does a good job of, uh, of, of pimping me out, shall we say, and, uh, and sharing our experiences uh, in the next hour. So really, this is up. This is for you. You're, you're the audience. Uh, however, many of you uh, want to get a question over, make sure you share it, and I'll make sure that we, we weave it into the debate. Three excellent panelists, uh, experts in their field, but also you know the wider environmental agenda. So you, you're not gonna hear too much from me other than interjecting when people decide to talk for too long and we need to move on and, and build the debate. So today we're talking about climate crisis. We're talking about the UN sustain, Sustainable Development Goals. We're talking about climate emergencies um, locally, and we're, we're working on how we take um, global issues and make them tangible and local in a way that we can act and respond. And we want to start by focusing on the waste industry or the waste and resources industry uh, if, we, if we broaden it to its, to its truest entity. Because I, I don't want to sit here and focus on aviation. I don't want to sit here and focus on, on retail or, or transportation in its broadest sense because lots of moving pieces, lots of debate already happening. I wanna focus on a sector that we feel confident and comfortable about, something that we understand intricately and deeply. If we can work out what some of these levers are, how do the UN Sustainable Development Goals factor into waste and resource management decision-making? How do we build infrastructure that is gonna enable us to deal with climate crisis? These are the kinds of questions that I think we need to think about as a UK or as a nation, whether you're here or abroad, but also how do you think about it as a local authority, as a municipality, as a decision maker at a smaller scale? They're the themes that have set the panel. So I'm gonna hand over now to, um, where should we go first? We're gonna go with Lee, I think. Lee's gonna open up, talk a little bit about UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, and a little bit about Suez's sort of corporate response to that. Then we'll hand over to Paul. Paul will talk a little bit about how, what does that mean for the UK and how do we think about that within the resources and waste sector. And then we'll hand over to Mickey from Somerset who talk about that more local agenda and what does climate crisis mean for a, a Somerset authority or a group of authorities and what are they doing about making sustainable development goals a reality. So that's the plan, five minutes each and then we'll start the questions rolling. I've got a few up here on my sleeve ready to go but if you've got some, drop them in, I'm ready for you. So Lee, the floor is yours, thank you for joining me. Excellent, thank you Adam, thank you Shweta. Uh, and thank you all for joining us on, on this webinar. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today and I look forward to the discussions and the debate, debate during it and also discussions in the future. Um, so as, as Sweshler introduced me, I'm the Environment and Sustainable Development Lead for Suez Recycling and Recovery UK. Having worked for Suez for just over 12 years, the last four or so in the area of sustainable development. Uh, which coincidentally coincided with the development of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, coincidentally, I may add. Um, my role in the UK is ultimately to drive sustainable development into the UK Suez business strategy. And I also represent the Suez UK business unit on the Global Sustainable Development Network. 
So hopefully you all know that the Sustainable Development Goals were agreed by the UN member states in 2015 and comprise of 17 goals supported by 169 targets. Identifying where we need to take action, both locally and globally, and to create a better sustainable future by 2030. Um, I think one of the benefits of the goals is that they apply to, to everybody, be it an individual, be it businesses, be it local governments, um, and everybody can take meaningful actions, which if we amalgamate these up and contribute these, we can take much more significant global action to address the challenges we face. I think the fact that they provide a common language to, to Suez and our stakeholders means we have several touch points where we can adapt and discuss certain topics and contribute and take action towards the common good effectively in partnership, uh, which is one of the 17 goals as well. Um, the Suez Group is strongly committed to the Sustainable Development Goals uh, and in 2017 we introduced our Sustainable Development Roadmap which outlines our commitments and our strategy towards the, the 17 goals uh, and we also joined the Global Compact uh, globally as well to drive and support the Sustainable Development Agenda. Uh, more so in the UK, uh, we're currently aligned with the group strategy and focusing our efforts to see how and determine how we can contribute to this broad agenda. Um, and currently we're specifically mapping our efforts against the sustainable development goals and identifying the opportunities where we can take action as an organization, but also with our, our partners as well. Uh, some, some good examples of where we can contribute to these goals, which also link into the climate agenda and climate crisis, obviously start with Sustainable De Development Goal 12 and Responsible Consumption and Production, putting the circular at the co economy at the heart of what we do. And that might be through our stakeholder discussions to look at alternatives for packaging, through to development of reuse shops to prevent waste becoming a waste or items becoming a waste in the first place, through to generating energy or electricity from waste that can't be prevented or recycled. Um, on that point, we, uh, we procure 100% renewable energy in the UK through a self-supply deal here at Suez. Uh, and we've also just recently introduced our electric car policy, uh, which is quite exciting and leading the way for future developments in terms of electrification, which is quite an exciting agenda point at this time. So there's plenty to go at, lots that we're doing within Suez, and hopefully Adam can tease that out of us during, during this session. Thank you. I think you're on mute, Adam. Uh, Adam, you're on mute, so I don't know if you're able to speak. You want me to dive in? <laughs> yep, go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, uh, thanks. Sorry, I think Adam's Adam's on mute at the moment, but um, but I will dive ahead anyway. So uh, thanks very much, uh, Swetha and uh, and Adam, um, uh, for allowing me to speak on this topic. Um, I've been working in environmental consultancy uh, for the past uh, eighteen years or so, um, particularly with local government, but also more recently internationally. Uh, and this, I guess, is where, when we're looking at sustainable development goals, this is where there's quite a sort of strong interaction. And so, first off, um, the SDGs interact with uh, waste and resource management at many levels. And, and just coming back to the, uh, the starting point, I guess, um, the definition of sustainability, sustainable development, is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So by definition, the extraction and use of resources arising as waste or their ongoing availability is a fundamental component of sustainable development because you're looking forward to what is actually available for future generations. Furthermore, um, the environmental impacts um, uh, of um, raw material extraction uh, the movement of those raw materials, the secondary materials, and the degree of energy required to convert uh, those resources into new products um, needed by subsequent generations, all have carbon impacts. And this is where effective resource management and circular economy thinking should be engineered to achieve 
improvements in those areas. But by the term engineering, um, we should be very clear that technical solutions are only one component in the circular economy chain, if you want to call it that. And the SDGs are very broad. Um, as, and as the term sustainable development goals apply, uh, sort of implies, they're a developmental term. You know, they, they, they are, they are for, as Lee mentioned, from the UN. Um, and when you look at UK PLC, which is kind of my, my focus, if you like, in terms of this, this presentation, um, well, we don't have a great deal of involvement with the UN as the UK PLC. Um, whereas if you go to a developing country, then there's a lot of engagement through UNICEF, through different programs that might be going on within a uh, developing country context. Um, so I think this is quite interesting to look at actually how, uh, how this relates to the UK. I mean, does the average householder know what, a, what a, uh, an SDG is? I wouldn't have thought so. So I think that this is where uh, it's, it's quite an interesting topic to bring in. So yes, they are, they are broad. Um, um, and so they do apply strongly in the developing country context. Um, but uh, they're not balanced from country to country and context to context. So my focus here on UK, and here we perform poorer in terms of some SDGs than developing countries. So for example, in terms of uh, consumption and production, carbon impacts, uh, ours might be quite high, a lot higher, but then we're significantly better in others, whether that's equality, public health, energy supply, sanitation, um, clean water, justice, governance, all sorts of issues where um, the framework is much better established in the UK. But in our lifestyle changes, faster pace, more convenient, higher expectations, um, provide opportunities for manufacturers to cater for these needs, often at the expense of what you might call some of the environmental SDGs, like 12 or 13, 12 the resource management one, and 13 the climate change one, but also potentially at the cost of other environmental SDGs, um, impact on life, water, land, public health uh, in developing countries, where our controls and systems have failed, for example, for in allowing exports of inappropriate materials, where manufacturers do impact on environmental uh, SDGs, they can also look at the benefits, whether that's through uh, SDG 8, which might be employment, economic growth, or 9, uh, innovation, infrastructure, and industry. So an example of this in the UK context was a presentation I went to at the LARAC conference, which is like a recycling advisory group, um, last year by a, a coffee capsule manufacturer. Um, which may or may not have had George Clooney as an advocate, where they entirely misjudged the audience in the sense that they had a very slick presentation but could only really focus on the agricultural benefits of their product because the delegates there saw through their bespoke collection recycling service, which was being trialled through a council in one uh, uh, UK area. They're, the delegates were all waste managers, so they were well aware that everyday single-use products can't rely on councils offering, offering a dedicated collection service and that actually impacts on both resource use and climate change uh, SDGs. And so to me that example highlighted the challenge of SDGs and the importance of a holistic view across them. They're context specific. So the agricultural benefits in that country where the coffee is grown is difficult uh, to assess from a UK perspective. And whether this is more beneficial than the negative impacts of the product disposal that we see here. So in short, for effective resource management, uh, products such as these should be challenged and targeted through consumer action, EPR, materials, taxes and other things. But the first of those, consumer action, is where change really happens. That's a big driver. So just to round up, um, we've got COP26 looking at climate change later this year in Glasgow. Uh, the UK public, the public sector and the waste management industry has made huge strides in transforming the sector to reduce carbon impacts from landfill and displace material impacts from secondary resource recovery. 
but the waste and resource management industry in the UK or, or elsewhere is like the third runner in the carbon relay race. Um, we can only really perform if, the, if those before us are racing and they're going in the same direction. And also we've got to hand the baton after us as well, because we've got to provide those resources uh, into, into secondary markets. And so this means that uh, consumers, um, pressurizing manufacturers, businesses responding, governments incentivizing, regulators enforcing, educators advocating, and householders participating in systems correctly. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. Sorry, I am back, everybody. Uh, you, you're not going to have, have a whole session without me. Uh, I had some minor IT difficulties. Excellent, Paul. Uh, brilliant analogy about relay running as well. Anybody who gets a sports analogy into a discussion about the UN Sustainable Development Goals deserves a bonus point. So there's your bonus point. Um, you didn't suggest that effective relay running is not only about teamwork because that running in the same direction is one thing. You've got to be running at almost the same speed to get the baton across. And I think that's a really interesting challenge because some of those other sectors along that chain are probably way behind where we are in trying as a waste sector, trying to innovate. So I think that's really interesting. And we've got Mikey coming on in a minute. Maybe, maybe he'll have a, Mickey will have a, a perspective on that. Uh, back to Lee. Thank you very much, Lee. I didn't get a chance to, 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 to critique you afterwards. Really interesting. Great to see that we sewers are doing stuff in this space and that, you know, the UN is setting a big global or oh, dictionary. Uh, a, a lexicon, you know, it's a lexicon of terminology that we can all use. But, but Paul did set you that question, or all of us that question. How many of the general public know what the Sustainable Development Goals are? Could they name? Was it, was it 19, 26, 169 activities? I mean, I'm struggling and, you know, this is kind of my day job. So, you know, just back to you, Lee, just briefly before we bring Mickey in. Do, do we think this language is, is getting out there to the consumers? So I think it's a very interesting question and I'm perhaps uh, going to embarrass myself a little bit here uh, in the answer. Um, you may or may not know that a few months ago, uh, well, you won't know this, but I, I was sat in my car whilst the wife was in Boots, reading through the Boots Health and Beauty magazine, as you all do. Um, and on one of their pages, there was actually the one good thing. To, there was one suggestion you could do each day of the week, which would give something back to society. And I uh, was flabbergasted to see that on a Saturday, it was actually go and have a look at the UN SDG website and have a look at the sustainable development goals. So for all of those boots enthusiasts, I'm sure they could recite them or maybe not. But um, I think there's a, an interesting uh, action there being taken by boots to get the message out there. I think just to follow on from that and the, uh, the question that Paul raised in terms of do the public understand the SDGs? Perhaps not, but equally, do they understand what is taking place or needs to take place for the climate emergency and how they can contribute to that? And I think that the SDGs actually, when you drive down into their targets and you look across the SDGs, so you can take action against quality education to raise awareness on how to contribute to mitigating climate change. So, or you can handle your... Uh, your, your resources responsibly looking at SDG 12 or you can uh, preserve biodiversity looking at SDG 15 so I think the SDGs give that platform an inroad although I appreciate that the, the message and have experience of delivering the complex message. Absolutely that, that, that overall framework I think is important you know you're right and the specificity around climate crisis or greenhouse gases or, or whatever phrase is going to resonate and people are going to act upon. I think we have to join those dots and make it easy for, for society uh, and for our sector and, the, and the, the bits of other sectors that we interface with are having the right conversations about stepping up our game and, and moving forward in a collaborative way. So, so thanks for that, Lee. Paul, excellent presentation. Let's hand it over to, to, to Mickey Arena at Somerset now. Let's talk a little bit about that local issue what what is going on in Somerset and how are you responding to this agenda Mickey and welcome to the panel thank you Adam um, so yeah my role here is um, heading up the Somerset Waste Partnership so our kind of responsibility is around household recycling and, and rubbish collections and disposal and, and servicing schools but I guess I'm also part of the office the group um, reflecting the fact that um, all of our partner authorities so the four district councils and the county council declared climate emergencies back in early 2019 so 
as is usual, the wording was all slightly different, but the ambition was the same, really, kind of carbon neutrality, aiming for 2030, and looking at the whole of Somerset, not just our own operation, and therefore trying to work in partnership with the community and, and with different organisations. So, I mean, I'm not sure the sustainable development goals were the, were the driver before for that. I think that they're, they're influential to a kind of um, an informed segment of the public, but I think what actually drove that was a kind of groundswell of public opinion going, actually, I really care about plastic. I really care about climate change. And for me, I think the UN Sustainable De Development Goals are probably a bit too complicated for the public at large. You know, people want a simplistic story. We still work with the kind of, you know, plastic isn't necessarily evil. There's too much of it. It ends up in the wrong place. Actually, on, in itself, it's not a, not a bad thing. So I guess what we've been doing in response to that is, is joining forces across all the partners and with others and, and going, right, what are we going to do to, to, to achieve that uh, climate emergency ambition, splitting our work up into different areas, so communication, field environment, energy, farming and food, industry, business and supply chain, natural environment, transport, waste and resource management, so in my bag, and, and water. And I think you can read a lot of that across to the sustainable development goals. The resources and waste specifically, uh, we're looking at three themes. So we're looking at commercial waste in the circular economy, that's going beyond our kind of traditional day job. And I think us reaching out into that space a couple of years ago would have been really challenging, would have been seen as, well, why are you, why are you stepping out over there? Your job is to you know, collect people's recycling rubbish and sort it out. But I think that that, that climate has changed. Uh, and I think that the sustainable development goals have contributed to that as have other things. We're looking at residential waste and behavioural change. And again, I think you see that throughout the sustainable development goals that, you know, it is behavioural change. We, you know, we can put services in place, but it's by working with people to get them to change their behaviours that things really happen. And then we're looking at public sector waste specifically. I'd say the thing that's really changed because of declaring a climate emergency is that we can have conversations that we couldn't, that were harder to have before, be it with our kind of, colleagues that care about the built environment, talking about giving real teeth to, to making sure homes are built with recycling in mind and, and, and the other, other other aspects that that matter to, to new homes and the existing stock and, and being able to have richer conversations with businesses, I think. So I think they're the key areas I see it changing and I can obviously talk through later in the discussion the kind of some of the more tangible and specific things we're doing. Um, but yeah, it does enable us to, to have a conversation with the public now that we couldn't before. So I think we were the first area to publish an end use register showing exactly what happened to all of our recycling each year. It was a fairly dull spreadsheet. Most people weren't interested in it. Actually, in the last year, we've started to have lots of people asking about that. So we turned it into an infographic and actually we can then use that as a tool to, to talk about. But actually, it's not just about the weight of stuff you collect. It's about the carbon. Here's the carbon impact of all the recycling. Here's the proportion, 91% of us that stays in the UK. And people people care about those things and want to have that conversation. And that's that's obviously changed the political climate and enabling us to, to take more action. Thanks, Mickey. That's fascinating. And it's great to see that, you know, you can make changes contractually, operationally, focusing on different materials, focusing on different technologies, which comes back to Paul's point about, you know, what is it that we, we can, you know, what levers can we pull? What, what choices have we got? Because we can't necessarily overly influence consumption necessarily, but we can influence our own consumption, but we can do better with, with the things that we handle and, 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 and we operate with it. So I've got a question coming from the panel. So let's, let, let's open it up. SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. To what extent do you believe that the resource and waste industry will have the opportunity to participate in government negotiation around trade deals and agreements, um, particularly those that involve the production and movement of materials, whether that be packaging or products? What do you think, Paul? Uh, have we got a chance to, to work with those other sectors and, and to influence that, that debate more widely? Good question. Um, uh, I mean, I'm... I'm aware that there's been a lot of engagement. I think you're on mute. Oh, am I still on mute? Can you hear me? I think I've switched it off. Uh, no, no, no. I can hear you, uh, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? Shall I, shall I carry on? Uh, uh, I'll try again. Can you hear me now? I, actually, I can hear Paul pretty well. Adam, do you have an issue with that? I, I think, Paul, you can carry on. Let me chat with Adam. 
Yeah, can, can yeah. you hear me, Lee? Can you nod as well? Yeah, ca carry on, Paul. I can hear you. Yeah, so like, <laughs> um, it's a uh, yeah, it's, it, it is a, a good question. Um, you know, we've there's been a lot of engagement around um, uh, government strategy on resources and waste uh, with with the development of the national strategy, and I know that has been pretty active with the waste sector, um, with uh, you know the, the areas around. Uh, extended producer responsibility and so on. Now, um, moving uh, forward in terms of negotiations with other countries and trade agreements, um, you would like to think that there would still be some uh, engagement in that area. Um, I do feel that government has, it's a personal view maybe, but I do feel that government has picked up the environmental agenda and taken it as an important area. And I think coming back to an earlier point I made that that's from um, and also perhaps um, as was mentioned from Mickey around Somerset it's very much a bottom-up effect there is so much interest in the sector there is so much interest in the environmental impacts or at least the packaging impacts um, the climate change message that um, government is uh, and has has said they will maintain environmental standards so I would like to see that that that, that message is carried through into trade negotiations. Um, I couldn't say for certain either way, but um, that was the, my impression is positive at the moment. Good, thank you. And and, and Mickey, from your experience, operating at a local uh, level, but interfacing with with governments more generally, as you know, as that policy evolution develops, that that, that Paul's alluded to there. Are we making progress? Do you think? Do you think we've really got a chance to change things, or or, or is it lip service? I don't think it's lip service. I do think DEFRA deserved you credit, really, for the way they've developed um, strategy and, and, and policy for, for meaningful engagement across the sector. Um, whether that will extend to international trade deals, I think, is, is a difficult one, just because the, the trade-offs they'll be dealing with there um, across government alone was, um, are, are challenging, aren't they? But I think I think the signs the signs are positive. I think the onus is on us as an industry to to come together. And I know there have been quite a lot of moves across industry to try and get more consistent approaches um, in terms of how we engage with government about, about issues like packaging, um, about issues, you know, deposit return scheme and things like that. Um, but but I think there are still challenges. For me, I'd, I'd use the plastics pack as, as an example, and I'm probably not going to make myself popular here, of, of where we haven't quite nailed it. We've got almost there. So, you know, I think whilst the plastics pack recognises, for example, that local government has a crucial role, I don't think it's fully recognised the constraints we're under. So we've come up with commitments around, by 2025, moving to compostable packaging as, as one of the types of more sustainable packaging. Yeah, I don't see the meaningful engagement with local government to say, well, how on earth is that going to work when these things, you know, often look and look and feel the same as plastic. So I think we 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 as a sector have got more to do to make sure that we're 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 putting ourselves in the position if that opportunity does open up to to speak with with as, as much of one voice as we can. That's wise words, Mickey. And, and I think, you know, reflecting on Paul's commentary, you know, I, I'm quite close to government and, and I spend a lot of time, you know, in, behind closed doors talking about innovation, talking about policy reform. I, 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 I've never felt so optimistic about our ability as a sector to influence Paul's relay race. Because I think we have got the baton before and after, so to speak, the runners are in the same rooms having similar conversations about how does this change our sector or change our business or is it a risk yes it is and so actually for the first time ever you know we are having open conversations with brands producers retailers consumers as you've if you've talked about mickey we're talking about remanufacturers reprocessors we if we can't get it right now we'll never get it right because that opportunity that the that climate crisis and, and the, the UN SDGs has, has created for us is, is now, you know, that we, we are talking the same language, we're responding to the same agendas, and we realise we're all part of a team. None of us are going to get clean growth. Um, none of us are going to uh, deliver, you know, a, a sustainable future, Paul's definition, w without playing nicely together and, and looking for uh, collaborative opportunities. So I am feeling very positive. But there we go. Somebody's just, just critiqued us. 
consistency in messaging is essential. So what do you think, Paul? Are, are we getting the messaging consistent, even if we're not always, you know, singing the same song? My, um, no, no, I don't think we are. <laughs> um, um, and the, the messaging is, is a challenge um, because we have these you know, very strong agendas and um, uh, sometimes a need to hook messages onto, you know, the, the plastics thing that, that, um, that Mickey referred to there. You know, it's, uh, it, it kind of goes both ways. The, the message gets too strong to a certain extent. Um, and, uh, but then you can still get beneficial outcomes from it. So for example, um, yes, we don't want to be necessarily moving away from everything that's plastic because you might uh, impact on something which has a, a larger carbon impact than the plastic did. Um, however, uh, in other contexts, the plastic, the interest that we've had, certainly at a local level, I, I work um, with a, uh, a community, it's like a sustainable community group here where, where, where I live. Um, and the numbers of that group has, has doubled in the last year, and, and I put that primarily down to plastics, or partly down to carbon, um, but so, so that we're getting a lot of interest and we're getting a lot of activity um, that happens on a local level as a result of those messages. So it's trying to channel them. I think it's this challenge you've got uh, as, much as, um, uh, as, as much as trying to get them consistent. I, 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 you're not the only one, Paul, that's been sucked into a uh, never-ending opportunity of local community interest. I, I, I'm also on a, a local environment committee that has, has boomed with interest levels. Unfortunately, there's probably too many things for us to, 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 to deal with um, for a small volunteer group. We've all got day jobs, but it's really interesting that plastics and carbon depending on whether you're interested in transport and emissions or you're interested in waste and resources has been the real hook. Um, so thanks for that question. Uh, those of you who are out there listening in, don't be shy in dropping another one in. Somebody's asked a quick question. It's not a quick question, but I'm going to make it a quick question. It's a very long question, but um, they're interested in the, um, the, the lack of consistent labeling, the lack of consistent messaging following on from the last caller. And, and interesting, they referenced the Vienna convention, which was about road signs and signals. Um, and they've given me a YouTube link, which I will be looking up later, but I don't, I won't, I won't do that now. And the idea that we need to get some international labeling to make the flow of materials and commodities, but also consumers, we are mobile after all. Is that something we should be looking at or, or, or is that one step too far, even with the UN pushing SDGs? What do you reckon Lee? And then I'll come to you, Mickey, cause you're working at the, at the coal face, so to speak. Yeah, I think we have we have to educate, we have to inform it if we expect consumers to make the right choices. Um, we've already touched on before lack of knowledge of the SDGs. Um, if if consumers don't have that information, they will un be unable to make informed choices. Um, obviously, in the UK, we've had the Waste and Resources Strategy and uh, the upcoming Environmental Bill, looking at uh, information labels, if you like, to educate consumers. So, I think it's definitely. Part, part of the solution. How that then uh, perhaps transitions across in, into the EU is quite interesting, but um, we all need to be educated to make the right choices. And Mickey? Probably it's one of those ones where in an ideal world, we'd have international consistency reflecting how material, how, you know, how packaging and other materials flow internationally, but I just think we've got to got to be realistic um and you know it's i think we're having a more positive and uh debate in this country i think about getting consistency from um packaging labels through to you know recycling systems and that's challenging enough and i think we should probably nail that one first i do think that's important i think sometimes it's it's over egged i think you know the reality is you know certainly if i look in somerset actually in with an out of migration are vast and having had the same systems for a number of years kind of people can make too much of the fact that there's a different system up in yorkshire or something and 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 and, and maybe different different labels so i think the opportunity to focus across the uk first is probably uh, the most important element and you know there is an interesting debate i think about how whether you kind of go to make it simplistic and, and binary for, for customers in terms of recyclable or not recyclable, or you reflect the fact that some things are, which are recyclable, but not very easily, this kind of, um, you know, packaging where it's laminates of different materials. Uh, for me, I think we should, 
I think we should be a bit more ambitious and assume that um, that um, people can take something more than than a, than a simplistic binary binary recyclable or not recyclable message. That's that's very interesting, Mickey, because of course we've we've we the sector has, has gone more binary in the last two weeks than, than than previously and that was a response to confusion and contamination um yeah. my mum my gran arguing amongst themselves about whether that film is or isn't recyclable so i think it's quite interesting that we can't agree and, and we we're quite advanced here in the uk in our thinking so how do you translate that to the indian subcontinent how do you put that into latin america um i do think consistency is really important but I think it's within a framework because I don't think we're ever going to have a unified system of labeling on, on products that says, you know, this is good. This is bad. This is recyclable. This isn't, I, I, I think that's too difficult. And actually if we spend all of our time talking about what's recyclable or not, haven't we missed the point, which is where Paul started, we've got to change our consumption patterns. Um, yeah. And if, if we all want to go out there and like, Oh, we're recycling. So, you know, happy days. I'm, I, I'm okay. I've done my bit. I, I, we, we're going to end up no better off. Um, which leads me to a really interesting question here. So I'm not going to hog, hog the time. Should we be transforming waste into renewable energy? Now, this is, a, this is a hot potato right now. There's plenty of people out there that on a carbon front would be arguing that, that waste into any form of energy is, 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 is uh, questionable. Um, we, we would argue differently probably at Suez. I'll, I'll let Lee speak in a moment. But I think where, where, what is the role of bioenergy, green energy, renewable energy in, in a circular economy or in a, uh, in a sustainable world, you know, 2030, 2050. Paul, what do you reckon? You, you, you alluded to this in your presentation. Um, yeah, it is, a, it is a balance and it will vary again from country to country. We're a high energy demand country. Um, so um, there's there's a sort of way of looking at this in terms of a transition position or a long term position, which might be different. And I think there was a mention in one of these questions around sort of hydrogen and other sort of long term, longer term sort of fuel and energy sources. Um, but uh, uh, at this point in time, you know, we do quite a lot of work looking at carbon balance for local authorities or what they do and recovering some energy from waste is definitely a, a, a good thing to do. It's but preferable to the alternative, which might be disposal to landfill. Um, it does depend on what the material is as well, of course. Um, if you are looking at bioenergy, if you're looking like the strat waste strategy is saying about more food waste separation, more energy from that source, yeah, it's a great thing to do because if you're throwing it away or you're burning food waste, then really you're not getting the best out of it. And in some cases you're getting the worst out of it. But uh, is that long term? Ideally, we wouldn't be producing the food waste in the first place. So, so it is a sort of, it's a moving picture, that. And also the benefit of um, every kilowatt hour of green energy or half green energy that you produce will hopefully become dirtier over time as more renewables come on stream for our, our energy mix that just comes down, comes through the grid. So, so it's a moving picture, yes, at the moment, but you'd like to see that perhaps diminishing over the long term. Thank you, Paul. And, and, and Lee, from, a, from a, a large corporate perspective, you know, we've got a large yes. number of, of EFWs on, on our portfolio at the moment, but I mean, where do you see that, that evolution and transition coming? Yeah, sure. I'll just jump back to the first question before that we were discussing before quickly. Uh, I forgot to mention, but uh, Quorn have actually started to come out and carbon label their their products, which Thank might you. be an interesting uh, one to watch, especially if they sell their products throughout Europe. Um, in terms of this question, I agree with what Paul said that especially today there's there's a need whilst we're in a transition for energy from waste facilities and capturing the value from waste that perhaps would otherwise be disposed of i think obviously what we've needed is clear direction and sight and the right um, fiscal and legal drivers if you like to provide certainty in the waste and resources industry uh, but perhaps what we'll see over over time is, is a shift in terms of the purpose of an energy from waste plant in terms of what materials are coming in and how is the value captured from those facilities as well. So whether we move from, uh, I guess, electron-based EFWs to more molecular-based and we look to generate fuels from those. Thank you. So we, we've had a question 
about how long might this transition be and i'll bring mickey back in i think all three of you will have a will have a comment on this but 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 clearly there is a transition happening in our sector now new policy new framework uh, we, we're looking at European targets around circular economy. They're transcribing into into, into UK practice and, and performance. And so, you know, everything is about to gear up for a change. Is that a five-year change, a 20-year change? Is it a 50-year change? So the first question is, how long do you think that transition is before we get to something that looks more sustainable, circular? And is the 2050 net zero carbon target likely to be hit? And if it is, can we hit it earlier? So let's start with Mickey at a local level and then we go Paul and then Lee. Mickey's on mute. Sorry, am I unmuted now? You are now. Hello. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it is going to take decades, I think, but it's how, 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 what the shape of the curve looks like is what I guess I'm more worried about rather than whether, you know, because I think there's too many uncertainties, uncertainties to know exactly when we'll hit it. I'd like to think we'll hit it earlier. Um, I think starting to make more tangible steps now to kind of zero avoidable waste is really important. It's one of the key drivers for us kind of changing our refuse collection from every two weeks to every three weeks. We know that, that you know, whilst we're adding in more plastic recycling and other things every week, um, that, thing, that is the single most impactful thing we'll be able to do to... To, to, to contribute towards that. Um, so I'm not sure if that's, a, that's an answer. Right. I think it's about how quickly we make change, but also how, how, how realistic we are. I mean, I think, I mean, I'm certainly of the view that we can't, you can't change everything at once um, in, a, in a complex system like ours and, hope, and expect it all to work. So I think we've got to be realistic um, in terms of well, what is the most important priority now. For me, that would be extended producer responsibility. At a national level, I think we, you know, if we don't get that in properly this time, you know, we'll, we, it'll, it potentially will drift for ages. And I think trying to do deposit return scheme at the same time is is too much. So I think it's about being ambitious but being realistic about how much can be done at once. Thank you, Paul. Yes, um, I, I would do. You know, I, I think yeah, Mick is right. You, you can't really put a, a date on it, but um, I would say that. The momentum that's really happened over the last couple of years, uh, I think, well, from, from someone who's been in the sector for a while, you probably think similar, Adam, on the on everyone else on the panel, I suspect, um, that that's probably taken us all by surprise. You know, the, 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 the amount that uh, the profile, all the changes, we've spoken about, um, you know, virgin material taxes, extended produce responsibility, deposit return schemes, they've all been discussed for 20 years. And now they're all happening um, to a certain degree, um, and uh, and that has been driven by you know public opinion uh, changes, you know more information, and so on, uh, leaders in the field, um, and those messages sticking. So um, so all those things have, have certainly pushed us forward, and I think um, there are too many uncertainties to say when things will happen, um, but I think the change is is, is happening, and it, and it will happen perhaps at a pace that surprises all of us still. Very positive. I, I, and, and you're right, I am as, as optimistic today as I've ever been about our ability and the potential of our sector here in the UK, but, but, but wider afield, because I think Europe is moving at exactly the same pace with just the same drivers in many respects. I, I, I think you could see a huge change, and I would say the next 10 years is my, is my gut feeling for a lot of that investment, because a lot of that policy will have come through and be live by 2022, 2023, UK and European wide. And that's when you'll see the brands, that's when you'll see the reprocessors, that's when you'll see the investment all coming to the fore. So, you know, I, I, people say, oh, you're not moving fast enough. I'm thinking, my God, the last two years has been quicker than the previous 20. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, uh, you know, I'm riding that wave. My surfboard is, is primed. Lee, any, any additional thoughts on that? I think just to recap on what you mentioned, Adam, the next 10 years will be quite interesting. So I'll perhaps move on to the, the question about achieving net zero early. I think it's quite interesting in terms of, of the sector. But if we look at organisations within the sector, you know, I'm sure there are some that can achieve net zero sooner than others, depending on their portfolio, uh, how their emissions are generated. So there's, there's potential opportunity there. I see. I think there's also the opportunity of 
who who want to be the leaders do oh, are organizations going to wait for the fiscal drivers or are certain organizations going to step out and maybe embrace EPR before legislation comes into play? I think we've seen some examples of that already, uh, but there is perhaps a fine balance there as well. Um, so I think it'll be quite interesting, but I think there's definitely organizations that could achieve it pre-2050. Pre there are certain organizations declaring uh, carbon neutrality today as well. Thank you. So we've got a long question, but I'm going to I'm going to simplify it because actually it's a topic that I'm going to be chairing a session on uh, in, in a few months. So the question is about bio-based plastics uh, and and then being seen to be you know part of this solution, particularly uh, consumer uh, angled messaging, and yet we don't have the infrastructure here in the UK. Interestingly, we we don't really have the infrastructure anywhere in Europe, to my knowledge, to be able to handle that kind of material in our traditional infrastructure. So the question is. You know, what is the role of bioplastics, you know, in this transition to a more sustainable, more circular system? Now, it is another session, so I don't need a long answer, but, you know, a quick, a quick soundbite from each of you, perhaps, on, on where you see bioplastics over the next, you know, five years, maybe, here in the UK. Paul? Uh, yeah, I think it's limited um, because of the, uh, the complications with collection and the complications with treating treating it and the need to have a simple message for people. If you want a quick answer. Thank you. Uh, Mickey? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd kind of say I, I hope it's limited because I think actually the more important areas of change are elsewhere and I think it confuses, confuses the public. I think if anything is going to happen, it needs the, the brands that are using it, the companies that are producing it to, to significantly step up from just like, claiming it can, it can be processed in some way to actually enabling that to happen and I don't I don't see that changing at the moment if I'm honest. I'm going to let you off Lee because I'm, I'm, I'm going to close that question down because everybody's in agreement and, and interestingly the, the, the webinar that we have planned will have some of those manufacturers on a call with me debating how do we make sure that their claims are backed up but more importantly how do we build the infrastructure to then to then treat it because EPR is going to force brands to finance you know additional plastics reprocessing in the UK and, and and in Europe so that's the question for me is how do we get that finance from the brands around bioplastics into the system to make it viable so let's move on quickly because there's loads of questions now it's already kicking off um, something about cross border working you know we've got england scotland wales and northern ireland you know blah 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 blah. other parts of the world will have similar jurisdiction issues Do we need to make this a uk issue there's a real political question for you boys and girls i'm going to aim it at, 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 at paul first should we should we be letting westminster for uk government make some decisions about um not only the the sustainable development agenda but also some of the priorities some of the funding streams uh, some of the infrastructure or, or is the devolved approach really the right one paul um i think as as our as the legislation and the interaction with products and materials becomes more complex which it is um then there is definite you know putting aside any sort of political view uh, then there is a uh, technical merit in doing that um, because we have these issues where you, you can have different DRS in Scotland to, 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 the, to England, um, different other you know, uh, legislative impacts from EPR or some, from other things. Um, and there's also the, the issue of strategic location of facilities and infrastructure. So if we are going to have a particular technology that deals with a type of plastic we can't recycle, then we, we don't necessarily want one in every place. Um, Wales is, is currently um, putting out a tender for AHP, um, absorbent hygiene products, um, a specialist technology there. Do you want those in every place or do you want to have more strategically located facilities? So yeah, uh, technically it would make a lot of sense. Uh, Mickey or Lee, anything to add to that? If not, I can move on to another question. So you, you let me know. No, I, from my perspective, as Mickey here, I just say cross border. Or I, I agree with all those points about it nationally. Cross border for me, I guess, means looking across the southwest and recognizing that, for example, our economic geography covers Devon as well. So, so when we're looking at, well, what can we do to support small businesses to understand how to navigate this? That's the that's the scale we look at when we're thinking about um, the kind of facilities we might need. You know, I think that's a southwest uh, perspective 
Um, so I think it, 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 it's not one answer for all aspects of the question. Lee, anything else or shall I carry on? Uh, I, I agree in short that there are lots of opportunities <laughs> for synergies and uh, better use of resources, I think. Good. So uh, another good question here about consumerism, particularly in the developing world. So let's switch geographies now briefly. Um, developing economies, rapidly uh, growing consumerism, rapidly growing middle classes. Uh, the whole issue of that outstripping the ability of urban infrastructure. You know it, Paul. We've, you've worked there. I've, I've done many a year overseas on the, exactly these projects. So are we playing catch up? Is it just about building more infrastructure and having better collection services? Or are we really going to start getting the big corporates involved in trying to change consumer patterns in developing economies? So what do you reckon, Paul? You, you've just come back from a trip, haven't you? Yeah, this is very fresh in the mind. <laughs> I was in Africa on Monday. Um, and I can, I can give you an example here. Um, informal workers um, do a lot of the collection um, in, in the area I was working in East Africa. So these are uh, unemployed entrepreneurs and they collect plastic bottles from the streets, from householders, from communal skips, from dump sites, and they take them to middlemen who bulk them up. They do a bit of sorting, bulk them up, and then they sell them on for recycling. Um, we visited those middlemen and there's one type of plastic bottle that they reject as contamination because it's the wrong color. Um, when we're walking around the cities, all the plastic bottle litter on the floor was of this particular type of plastic bottle. Um, so uh, the consequence of the manufacturer, uh, yeah, they may see, okay, this dark blue bottle is different from everyone else's. So, you know, people can see it on the uh, supermarket shelves and buy it. But actually you walk around the streets and that is the only form of plastic bottle because all the rest has a material value. Uh, and that follow that, passes down the chain from, from the, uh, the people that bulk it and sort of sort it down to these informal individual workers, they don't pick it up because they know there's no market for it, they get told not to. Um, and so that, going back to the SDGs very briefly, it's almost like a wrap up for me, uh, the SDGs, um, the consequence of that manufacturer is that it impacts on public health, flooding, those, those bottles block drainage ditches, it can impact on clean water and sanitation. It also impacts on resource use, climate action, life and water, life on land. It impacts on all those things from one decision from a manufacturer. So uh, that links to consumerism, that links to manufacturers, and I've probably used up too much time, but that, I'd just like to make that point. No, no, and given your recent travels, absolutely fantastic to, to, to bring that real world example to, to roost. Uh, Lee, as somebody that works for a big corporate that's got footprints all over the world, working with, 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 with you know, municipalities on waste and water globally, uh, any, any thoughts to share? Yeah, I think, I, again, I'll bring this back to, to my favourite topic, which is the SDGs, which obviously allow you to focus at home, but also overseas and in developed countries. Uh, and as Paul alluded to, there's many, many touch points there that span the SDGs and we can perhaps use our informed position or better informed position and our position as Suez <coughs> with a foothold in many other countries to continue those discussions, to help the discussions in, in those areas, to change practices, if you like, from manufacturers uh, and then in, inform users, if you like, how, how, how to promote sustainable consumption further down the chain thank you Lee. And, and i think the, the work we've been doing with some some of the big global brands here in the uk clearly suggests that they are looking globally and not just what's going to happen to changes in packaging design and changes in policy frameworks in in the uk and europe they are recognizing that it makes sense to do this everywhere that they've got business and, and therefore, if you're going to change supply chains, you're going to change packaging design, you're going to change materials, you're going to want to do that globally. And I, and I think they, 
they do want to do the right thing. It's just sometimes I don't think they know how to in some of these developing economy locations where the infrastructure is just so minimal that you, you, you kind of don't have a municipality to engage with. There isn't, the national government isn't really driving the agenda. So who do you go to? Well, in Paul's case, you go to the entrepreneurs, but that's a very different relationship for a big corporate to have. So I, I think if that's a journey actually, is how do we how do we make that work? But that's probably a topic for another webinar. So uh, I'm wrapping up these final questions. I'm, I'm gonna aim this one at, at Mickey first. Is Brexit and life post Brexit, whatever that means, um, going to affect our transition here in the UK in terms of greater sustainability, greater circularity. Are, are we worried or not? Quick one sentence answer from all the panel. Mickey, you're up first. Um, yes, probably worried because uh, worried because of uncertainty. Um, if I'm honest. Uh, probably to to do more to say too much more. I probably get in trouble with my political masters. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, nervous because of the uncertainty it creates. There are obviously ways of viewing it where there's an upside, and there are, and there are risks of a downside. But I'll probably leave it there. Thank you, uh, Lee. Anything else to add? Oh, sorry, I need to take it off mute. Um, <laughs> I, I think for me personally, it'd be good to see Brexit out of the way, just uh, following on from the B word so that we can then focus on these matters at hand, the, you know, the climate crisis, the SDGs. Um, just hot off the press today, the UK SSD has written to, to the PM to request better action and better uh, progress towards the UK and the SDGs just following up from uh, the report on progress they issued last year, where I think about 70 five percent of uh targets were not being achieved in the uk alone although we signed up to these goals back in 2015 so, so we get we're moving into sorry sorry i'm moving into now what is the the decade of action but we need to see the action now we've, we've been talking about it for some time well you gave me lots of positivity then and took it away with <laughs> with, 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 with rapid rap, rapid expansion uh interestingly you want to move from the b word to the c word so we're looking carbon and, and, and climate crisis i like that from brexit being the b word fantastic and paul what's your uh, what's, what's your take on 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 life post brexit um yeah I, th I think um optimistic from uh the public point of view and uh, politicians responding to the public pessimistic in the fact that there's going to need to be trade deals and where there's compromise we don't really want to see that on the environmental side of things so so that that's what worries me is it's it's, it's whether it falls aside in the way of the trade deals and um, some of these issues thank you conscious i have two minutes left and i'm going to ask each of you so to give me your uh, your sound bite for for so hashtag social media when we start posting this later everybody's missed some great insights we're going to we're going to give you a, a phrase each so in terms of sdgs climate crisis uh you know the the global agenda the local agenda what one thing would you be advocating we get on with now you know where are, where are we going to make the biggest impact or what's the lowest hanging fruit in terms of us making uh, our sector, so let's limit it, our sector, waste and resources, that little bit more carbon neutral. And we'll start with Paul, because he's already ready to go. <laughs> if only. Um, the, uh, the, I suppose the one thing would be to make... Um, for me, we to make producers appropriately responsible for the resource value and end of life impacts of their products. If you're after one thing, that because that would therefore impact on resource consumption, it would impact on um, how it's marketed, and it would impact on what happens to it at the end of its life. And is that extended producer responsibility or is that extended, extended producer responsibility? Well, it's probably further than we've got it now because we're now looking more at the, at the uh, end of life impact rather than its material value. In terms and, and, and so from your perspective, um, when you look at something like textiles, you've got to look at the cheap child labour, you've got to look at the water consumption in producing the cotton. That's the more holistic. So the price of denim jeans could be significantly higher in your world because yeah. of the inherent costs and concerns of the system in which it's produced. 
and you, and you won't, uh, you know, we first started off talking about consumerism, didn't we? And, and, and unless actually something significant happens in that area, then um, it, it will be business as usual. So we, 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 we need products and packaging and services that truly reflect the full costs of creating that, that service or that package or that product. Yeah, and that will then change our attitudes to reuse, refillables, repair, all the things that you and I unfortunately grew up with. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, the costs have to go up. So that's, yeah. that's all about the money. Okay, Lee, what about you? Where's, where, where's, I know it's a soundbite, but I might ask you another question. What's, what's, your, what's your takeaway message? I think collaborate partnership for the goals. We need to work together across the value chain and not pass the the problems on down the chain. So we were talking about bioplastics before and whether they provide a solution or not. I think we've got to have those discussions across the value chain to educate and inform and then ultimately holistically reduce the, the environmental impact from extracting raw materials through to manufacturing um, and what happens to those materials further down the chain as well. Fabulous. Come back to perhaps where I ended before and cool. taking action. Taking action. So I'm going to I'm going to hashtag you. That's Lee Broadhurst at Suez. Okay, and he said hashtag collaborate the vanilla ice of the resource sector. How's that? And finally, Mickey Green, what's your one takeaway message for our panel and uh, audience today? Um, echoing the other the other two panelists, I think move beyond a sector approach to a, a systemic approach. Uh, which I think we're on the way to doing. I think, um, you know, sticking with the hierarchy and making sure we are talking about reduction and reuse as well as emphasising um, recycling. I think that would be, yeah, that's not a, that's a rubbish sound bite. Um, I'll, but, um, I'll, make, I'll make it sound sexy later. You make it me. nice. You make hashtag it good. Hashtag yeah. systemic change. Hashtag it's not all about recycling. I, I'll, I'll take that away. Thank you, Mickey. Listen, yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure to host the three of you. Real experts, very passionate, huge opinion spread there from what's going on globally to what's happening locally. Um, it's been my pleasure to host you, so thank you very much in the usual way. It's been a pleasure to have so many of you stay with us for the entire hour. Uh, you know who you are. Hopefully you got your questions answered. If you didn't, you can find me and these experts very easily on social media. So don't be shy in asking us a question. I'm going to hand us back to Sweta now. She's co-convened today. I've been Adam Reed. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, I think we covered quite a lot of ground today. It was a very diverse discussion. I really liked the final takeaway for hashtag social media. So thanks everyone for, uh, for being there for the entire hour and for your questions. Uh, we really hope we've answered everything. And we have uh, two panels scheduled for February. You will get an email about it. So sign up to our newsletter. Bye everyone. Have a good day wherever you are.